All right, I want to do a video here on the subject of the Lord of the Rings, the writings of John Ronald Rule Tolkien. And uh, this is something that has been around for a very, very long time. I bought all these books and all this material and everything else when the big movies, the big three movies were coming out, the, you know, these things here. I'll show all this stuff on film here as we continue. But I've been wanting to do this study for a long time, and it just keeps getting put off and put off and put off and put off. And I, I, I'm a bit of a... Uh, detail freak you know I like to get everything in and, and just make sure I have everything every little point covered and, and so it ends up taking me too long to put studies together so this is one I just need to get it done um, honestly I just kind of put it on the back shelf because I thought well the whole fervor of the Lord of the Rings thing kind of died out and then I saw that they're coming out with another one in the series of I don't even know what it is but they're coming out with another one for this coming December. So I thought, okay, well, it's not died out yet. So I'm just going to explain that this stuff over here is all satanic. All right? It's paganism. It's witchcraft. There is no Christian symbolism whatsoever here. What Tolkien is symbolizing is Nordic mythology and witchcraft. All right? This has never been Christian. John Ronald Rule Tolkien is in hell burning right now. I guarantee you that. And I can... I'm going to be proving that in this video. This man was not a saved man. He was a mystical Roman Catholic. Not a saved man. He was not a Christian. He called himself a Christian, but he's a Catholic. right? He was not a Christian according to the King James Bible. And I'm going to prove that to you in this study. So what I did years and years ago, I read all of the books. I read The Hobbit. I read the... Um, the Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, The Return of the King. I read this whole thing, and I even read his book that supposedly comes before this time period here. I read this book here, The Silmarillion. All right, let me just show you these here on, on the overhead camera. Okay, there you have The Silmarillion. This is the one that supposedly, this takes place before these books here, these four books here. The Hobbit, Fellowship of the Ring, Turn of the King, Two Towers. There's your order of it right there. Okay. So before you go, did you even read the books before you're judging? You know, yes, I read the books. Yes, I've read them. Yes, I have actually studied all this stuff. I have read, show you another book here, The Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. I've showed this in some of my other videos uh, where he's openly admitting that uh, there are devils, that he has a demon of invention. And he says about how he didn't write the books, these Lord of the Rings books. They're not written by him. They're written by that other power that's always present, never named. Yeah. You know, even though the Bible talks about holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, they named the Holy Ghost. All right. And yet Tolkien's saying, I can't name who it is that wrote the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, because it was a devil. But I also have here the biography of Tolkien. So yes, I have done my research. I've read that. I also have over here the language of Tolkien's Middle Earth. All right, and it gets into all the whole the runic alphabet and everything else there. And um, here I have the fiction of Tolkien, Master of Middle Earth, and just a lot of things that were written in here, promoting the book and whatever else, saying it's great and everything. Uh, Tolkien's Sanctifying Myth. I read this thing. Here's a devotional book. Isn't that wonderful? Walking with Frodo. Yeah, it's called uh, a modern professing Christian that's lost that uh, decides to capitalize on a big Hollywood market film and make some big bucks on it and pretend that you can, you know, be okay watching the Lord of the Rings whole series thing and still be saved and be a Christian and things. You know, um, you might be saved and do all kinds of dumb things, but the point is you're not going to be in too good a fellowship with the Lord if you're messing around with this kind of witchcraft. And the Lord's convicting me and just saying, okay, if you, know, you need to get this study done, get these satanic books out of your home, burn them, which I'm going to be doing, by the way. Um, finding God in the Lord of the Rings. This one's funny too. You know, this guy here, um, what's his deal? Uh, yeah, Kurt Bruner. Let me let me zoom in here so we can see this fabulous guy here. Is vice president with focus on the family, where he leads in the creation of books, films, magazines, and radio drama, including the popular Adventures in Odyssey. 
So you get this lost hellbound man here. And I say he's lost because finding God in the Lord of the Rings? Excuse me? And he talks in here, the very first part of the book, he goes into saying about how he was in uh, London and he goes in to the Eagle and Child here, you know, the one pub where Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and these guys, where they would hang out at, you know. And it was, it was a lifelong dream to go to the pub where these wonderful men of God met. Yeah. I'm going to show some quotes with these books here as we continue. The Gospel According to Tolkien by Ralph Wood. Uh, Visions of the Kingdom in Middle Earth. Yes, yes. And Jesus Christ is symbolized by the wizard Gandalf. Isn't that spiritual? And then here you have these two books by this uh, Richard Abanes guy. Fantasy and Your Family, and Harry Potter and the Bible. Again, Harry Potter's bad, but Lord of the Rings is wonderful and good and Christian. Sure, sure. No favoritism or anything like that. But, uh, of course, like I said, I have all these movies here. Um, here's the regular DVDs, full screen, blah, blah, blah. Then the Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers, the Return of the King, the whole satanic package there that you can get. So yes, I have done quite a bit of research into this whole thing. And like I said, I could talk for hours and hours and hours on this. But honestly, there are so many things that are more important right now. All right? And this stuff here, you know, having watched it, and I don't watch it very often, but it was just, you know, I don't watch too many Hollywood movies is what I'm trying to say. But having watched this, I can tell you there's nothing Christian about it. And this definitely, you know, it's PG-13. Uh, years ago, this would have been beyond rated R almost. The blood and the gore and the violence and the open Satanism and things like this. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. All right. Just really, really wicked. They even showed a, a there's a segment in one of them. I forget which one of these extra ones, these, you know, these bigger editions, one of these things. There's one of them where they actually are talking about the uh, special effects crew. And they're talking about the different days that they had. It took them like three years to make the stupid movies or whatever. And they say at one point, they say that uh, they celebrated day 666, day 666, you know, with a satanic party. And there's video of them and they're, you know, dancing around and stuff like this, dressed up like Satan worshipers and things. Now, if this is a great Christian film, why would they be doing a thing like that? It's not Christian. Never has been, never will be. You know, but let me just show you a couple things here. If you are familiar with the story of the Lord of the Rings, if not, don't worry about it. Don't waste your time. It's satanic. But if you are familiar with it, there are a number of names and things that are going to look real familiar here when I show you this. This here too, by the way, let me just, before I show you that, um, this is why, what I co uh, compiled over the years, all my notes and things that I took, all the quotes and everything. Um, just going through here and, uh, just amazing. I mean, from trying to see where the end of it is. Okay. Right there. All these pages right here are the notes that I took down through the years. I was actually originally, before I got into video ministry, I was, I was going to write a book. That's why I compiled all this information. This whole folder here is on, uh, Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, well, Tolkien's writings and the, Lord, the whole Lord of the Rings thing, The Hobbit, The Sil Silmarillion, all that stuff. Uh, it's also on C.S. Lewis, so I'm going to be talking about him too as we continue. But uh, I'm just going to show you some of these quotes here in this video. Um, like I said, I'm not going to spend much time on this because there's just so many other things I need to do. So, But let me show you this and see if you know some of the terms of Tolkien's uh, whole series here to see if he has this map thing on it um see if i can find a one of the maps that he has of his uh middle earth thing uh, there it shows a little bit okay yeah it really doesn't no it really doesn't say but let me show you what i'm talking about here Okay, here do you have the Nordic Mythos. This is a book I had. It was a spell book and things, this runic spell book deal. And, and 
again, I've been holding on to this thing so I could put it into my writings, but uh, time to get rid of this garbage. But uh, it goes on into here and to explain a lot of this different things. And, but look at this. This is where it gets really interesting. You know, he talks about the two towers and that there are different trees and symbologies of trees and things. Right here is what uh, Tolkien basically plagiarized. Check this out. Here you have this big tree, this world tree looking thing. Yggdrasil, I'm not, I guess is how you pronounce that. And it goes upside, you know, then you have the down here. But it goes up and then you have this and whatever else. And if you know the story, what's the, the white city of the realm of the men? It's Isengard. Look at here. Asgard. And at the end of the movie, you see the, the big eagle and stuff like this flying around, saving Frodo and Sam and things. See? Right there. The eagle. That's where Tolkien got it from. And down here you have Midgard and Middle Land. Hmm. Kind of like Middle Earth. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that. You know? And then you have different realms here. The realm of the elves. The realm of the Vayner. Valinor in Tolkien's world. The realm of the frost giants. The land of ice and mist. Hell there, realm of the dead. Gee, I wonder where they got that word from. You know. Uh, realm of the dwarves. Hmm. Interesting. So again, you see a lot of this stuff here is taken and put right into Tolkien's books. He just changed the, some of the wording around. You know, it's just amazing. But a lot of these uh, pagan deities and things here. Um, there you have Odin. You know, all-seeing eye down there. Over here. Odin at the Fount of Wisdom. Just trying to find something else here quick. Um, okay. Of tarot card here. The Hanged Man tarot card echoes Odin's act of self-sacrifice to obtain the runes. So, who was Gandalf the wizard really symbolizing in The Lord of the Rings? All these people over here, these, these professing Christians that are saying that Tolkien's myth was a symbolic of the Bible and all this other stuff, they say that Gandalf symbolized Jesus Christ. Even though in the Bible, back in the book of Leviticus, it talks about that you're not to seek after wizards to be defiled by them. Huh. How could you make that symbolic of Jesus Christ? You seek after Jesus Christ, you're not defiled by Christ. Hmm. But again, you see this whole thing here of, of uh, you know, Tolkien stealing from Nordic mythology. Okay, I don't think that there's anything else in here I'm going to show. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of this stuff in, in through here. But it's funny, you know, they have, they have all these different things here. Here you have the... Uh, let me back out a little bit here. The index. Then you have the different holidays. Fall equinox. November Eve. Also known as... Uh, Samhain, Halloween there. May 1st, there. The Maypole, the sexual phallic ceremony that that is. Summer solstice, Lamas. Winter solstice with Yule and Satan Claus. Mm -hmm. Imbolg, spring equinox with Easter. Ishtar, Astarte, whatever you want to call it. So, and then they go into the thing in here of preparing wood for, you know, um, selecting a tree to make your runes and everything else. And then you can make them from natural materials or whatever else you want. And then these runes supposedly have magical powers and you can cast the runes and you can do all kinds of stuff like this. And interestingly, let me show you a book here. Here we have a, uh, and this is a, this is a decent book, but it just, let me just show you some of the, the brainwashing that goes on here. Concise Dictionary of the Occult and New Age by Deborah Lardy and Don Liu and Paul Ingram. Okay. 
we're going to go back here. A lot of these, like I said, a lot of these entries are actually pretty good. But I'm just going to show you here the mindset of some people. Um, Okay, rune. Ancient alphabet characters of Northern European peoples, often thought to have magical significance. Rune alphabets included the 32-letter Anglo-Saxon, the 16-letter Scandinavian, and the 24-letter Teutonic. Runic characters tend to be mostly of straight lines, which are easier to carve into water stone. These alphabets were in use at the time of Christ and did not fall into extinction until the end of the Middle Ages. Okay, now... If you study the whole thing about runes, basically witches have been using these things for centuries. It's it's uh, divination. They they can use in the different runes have different powers to, to tell if you're uh, if you're going to have wealth or if you're going to have love or whatever. And you see a lot of these modern, you know, professing Christians like Michael W. Smith. He and he puts runic letters into his name on some of his different albums. And his Christmas album, you know, he has a rustic cherry standing on it. It's a runic M, and he's standing there like this. I think it's like the T was rune or, rune or something, where he's doing like a arrow shape, like a T with the two arms bent down. You know, Rick Warren. There's a picture of him floating upside down in a, a swimming pool, and he's and he's got his arms in the down position like that. These people are Satanists. They are into witchcraft. And, you know, if you study it, I mean, obviously, this thing here, I'm going to be burning this for sure. This thing here came from a witch's book, all right? You say, why'd you have a thing like that? Because I'm a researcher. And you say, well, you shouldn't have it. I know. That's why I'm going to get rid of it after I do this video. But look at the, look at the mindset here. Okay, here you have the same runes. You go over here to the next page, and it goes down... And it says, modern fantasy writers have been known to draw on the Scandinavian myths so that runic magic figures prominently in their stories. This does not mean these writers have a pantheistic worldview or a New Age orientation. For instance, J.R.R. Tolkien, a fervent Roman Catholic, included runic magic in the plots of his fantasy stories, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings trilogy. See also divination and magic. Wait a second. So... Divination magic rune casting is evil and bad and wicked and in your concise dictionary of the occult and new age and yet when Tolkien used it it wasn't bad because he was a devout Roman Catholic. Okay. Nice thought there. But uh, let me zoom out here a little bit. Now we're going to get into some of these quotations and I'll show you the the books where they come from but uh, okay it says here and this is uh, in his book about the letters and things and it says and I am in any case myself a Christian but the third age was not a Christian world page 220 right there's your quote all right and number two there where do I have my little guide? Okay, number two is the uh, the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, so this is the biography and the letters. So number two, I have the number two there, right there. Uh, let's see where the book is. This book right here. Okay, I'm not going to page to all these because it takes too much time, but um, there you see the quote. He says that this whole third age, the middle earth type of a thing, is not Christian. And yet you have these people, like that book over there, that I just put on the floor there, you have these people and they're going, well, yes, you know, runes are bad, but when Tolkien uses it, it's okay. Sure it is. Down here we have... The other power then took over the writer of the story, but by which I do not mean myself, that one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. There's all the stuff in this book, Life and Letters of Tolkien. That's what I was referring to earlier. He openly claims that he was not the writer of the book. 
Now in the occult world, that's known as automatic writing. All right. In other words, you just sit there and the devils come in and they just write the thing out or type the thing out or whatever. You're just like a, a car that has a driver in it, you know, and the driver is a devil. Number two, letter to Camilla Unwin in reply to her question, what is the purpose of life? So it must be said that the chief purpose of life for any of us is to increase according to our capacity, our knowledge of God, by all means we have. So in other words, Tolkien believed that you can study the occult, you can study Norse stuff and paganism and, and the runic languages and things like this. You can study all that stuff and that's increasing your knowledge of God. Well, maybe his God, the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Let's go up here. This is from his biography, part 4, chapter 2, page 133. His commitment to Christianity, and in particular to the Catholic Church, was total. Yeah, well, I hate to tell you, but Catholic is not a Bible word, and there's a good reason for that, because Catholicism is not Christianity. It is not the faith that was presented once to the saints in here. And I've done lots of studies on that, so don't get all bigoted and narrow-minded and start judging me. You know, watch my videos on Catholicism. Here's talking about his wife down here in his biography. There's the chapter, page, everything. Edith has always hated confessing her sins to a priest. Her wife, uh, Tolkien's wife, was a Protestant. She didn't like the thing of having to go to the confessional and confess her sins to a priest. Proves that she had a little bit more sense than he did. Okay, life and letters here. You have a letter to his uh, son, I believe that is. Um, C.S. Lewis there, for instance, reveres the blessed sacrament and admires nuns. Oh, yeah. C.S. Lewis was a closet Catholic. He said, I don't believe that. Okay, here's a book. Another book I did some research with, Joseph Pierce, C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church. Nice little cigarette he's got there, you know, but uh, interesting publisher too. But, you know, in here, I might have some of these quotes in through here, so I don't want to go through a whole lot of it. But it talks about how many Catholics came back to Catholicism after reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You better watch out for this stuff. All right, Life and Letters here, and I talked about this one in another video. Father Robert Murray, he wrote that the book left him with a strong sense of a positive compatibility with the Order of Grace and compared the image of Galadriel to that of the Virgin Mary. The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Wait a second. Earlier he says, no, there's nothing Christian about it. Now he's saying it's fundamentally religious and Catholic. Okay, and as I talked about in other studies, this Galadriel, she had blonde hair, and if you see the movie or if you read the book or whatever, they make a really big point about that, that she has this blonde hair. And if you study the ancient pagan queen of heaven, Semiramis, who was also known as Astarte and Diana of the Ephesians there, and, you know, Xingmu in China and, and all these different names, you study this queen of heaven, she had blonde hair. So why would Tolkien picture Mary with blonde hair? Because it's the real Mary of the Catholic Church. That's why. Life and letters down here. Actually, I am a Christian and indeed a Roman Catholic. It's kind of a contradiction there. Down here again. See all this stuff? It was also the Elvish and uncorrupted Numer Numenorian view that a good man would or should die voluntarily by surrender with trust before being compelled as did Aragorn. So you can die uh, you know, willingly there. Hmm. Going down, it says, The assumption of Mary, the only unfallen person, the only unfallen person, hmm, may be regarded as in some ways a simple regaining of unfallen grace and liberty she asked to be received and was having no further function on earth. It was also unthinkable that her body, the immediate source of our Lord's, um, without without other physical intermediary, should have been disintegrated or corrupted, nor could it surely be long separated from him after the ascension. Chapter and verse. 
Could you please show me the scriptures where Mary went up? She was there with the early Christians in Acts chapter 1. Where does it say she went up? It says Jesus went up. They recorded that. Uh, don't you think it'd be just as miraculous if Mary went up? Where does it say it? It doesn't. You know why? Because Mary was just a regular old sinner like any of us. She's not a god. And she never has been. And she never will be. Mary is going to go up, by the way, sometime. There will be the assumption of Mary, but it's going to be when the dead in Christ rise first. She's going up with all the other dead saints and the living saints, we which are alive and remain, are going to be caught up together with them to meet them in the cloud, or to meet the Lord in the air. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. A little fly here, excuse me. There we go. Got him. All right. Uh, down here... Second one, he says, Frodo was sent or allowed to pass over uh, sea to heal him. He went both to a purgatory and to a reward. <laughs> okay. You're going to go down and you're going to burn for a while. That's a reward. Wow, what a wonderful thing. I mean, how is this a good thing if you're a Catholic, you know? I'm going to go, you're, you know, after death, you got to burn for a while. Uh, doesn't the Bible teach that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin? Oh, that's right. It's the blood that you drink if you're a Catholic. See, Catholicism is paganism. It's ancient Babylonian paganism with Christian names is what the thing is. And Tolkien knew it. And that's why Tolkien is blending paganism with Catholic type of symbology and Christian types of things and stuff. He understood what Catholicism really was. If you say, could you point to a real, true Catholic that really understands Catholicism? There's your boy, right there. Tolkien. He understood what Catholicism was. Hmm. Here he says, uh, up here, page 338, uh, we're still in uh, Life and Letters of Tolkien. I should deny the Blessed Sacrament, that is, call our Lord a fraud to his face. So in other words, Tolkien, his Lord was a cookie. Little round wafer. Down here he says, I fell in love with the Blessed Sacrament from the beginning. Um, I fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ when he saved my soul. And I don't have to go back and eat him. Eat his flesh and drink his blood like a cannibal. Weird system you got there if you're a Catholic. Down here in the same book, page 394 to 395, he says, Has it ever been mentioned that Roman Catholics still Roman Catholics still suffer from disabilities not even applicable to Jews? Oh, you poor little thing, you. Yeah, sure, you know. I mean, those Jews haven't suffered nearly as bad, you know, as the Catholics have. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Did you ever hear of World War II? You know, where the Catholic Adolf Hitler and the Catholic Heinrich Himmler and the Catholic uh, Joseph Goebbels and all these guys, Nazis were Catholics. Did you ever hear how they murdered six million of the Jews? But boy, those sure Catholics, they suffer. Oh, poor things. Okay, same book, page 407. I was particularly interested in your remarks about Galadriel. I think it is true that I owe much of this character to Christian and Catholic teaching and imagination about Mary. The blonde-haired Galadriel. I thought this was interesting down here. Quotes where Tolkien uses occult terminology. Um, his biography, uh, right there, page 30, it says, I desired dragons with a profound desire. Huh. Well, I think he got in contact with one of them, who the Bible identifies as Satan, the dragon that was in heaven there in Revelation chapter 12, and he's Satan. I think the Tolkien probably got in contact with that special dragon that he wanted to have a, a good relationship with. Um, here, autobiography, page 6, or chapter 6, page 73, says... Following the light unflinchingly. Kind of sounds Masonic. Or, you know, the angel of light as the Bible talks about. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
His elves, though capable of sin and error, have not fallen in the theological sense and so are able to achieve much beyond the powers of men. So, um, hmm, let's see, that's, that's rather interesting. Uh, his elves haven't fallen. Now, in the Bible, there's also a group of men that haven't fallen. Some have. But there's others that have it. You say, what's that? Do you ever hear of a fallen angel? Mm -hmm. Tolkien, in his book, has elves inbreeding with men. Hmm, how about that? And you read Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the sons of God. Read over in the book of Job, sons of God are angels. The sons of God coming in unto the daughters of men and bearing Great men, mighty men, giants. Hmm. Did Tolkien know about that? No, I'm sure he was a fine Christian, you know. Here we go again in the biography. Speaking of a colleague and friend of Tolkien's named E.V. Eric Valentine, he had been a Rhodes Scholar. Oh boy, <laughs> a Rhodes Scholar, just like Bill Clinton. You know, these guys that get into the Rhodes Scholarship or the Council on Foreign Relations or whatever, these guys work together to form the One World Government, the New World Order. So, kind of interesting company there that Tolkien is keeping. But um, here, go, here again, um, this is his biography, page 150 to 151. It says here, but said Lewis, uh, myths and lies, even though lies breathe, breathe through silver, no, said Tolkien, they are not. So they're talking about paganism and stuff like this. And, and he's like, you know, well, the pagan stories and stuff like that, they're, they're just lies. They're just breathed through silver. You know, a nice little scholarly way of saying, oh, they're still wonderful and everything. And Tolkien says, no, they're not. Tolkien believed in the pagan myths and things like that of the past. Here we have the biography again, page 151. We have come from God to continue Tolkien. And inevitably, the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light. Our myths may be misguided, but they steer however shakily towards the true harbor. Um, okay, why don't you just read the Bible and believe the Bible? There's no myths in there. All right. Back to the biography here, chapter 5, or chapter 1, page 182. Keep seeing the thing there. The name Gandalf, taken like all the dwarf names from the elder, Ida was given to the wizard, for whom it was eminently suitable on account of its Icelandic meaning of sorcerer, elf, and hence wizard. And this is the guy that symbolizes Christ, according to a lot of these uh, Christian authors over here. Sure it does. Autobiography. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken, the magic, or rather art, has fallen. Or, excuse me, failed. The spell is broken. As soon as you start to disbelieve Tolkien's writings, the spell is broken. I sure hope you break the spell. Chapter 2, page 208. Tolkien told his publisher, Stanley Unwin, It is written in my life blood. So this isn't just some kind of a oh, cute little thing or you know, whatever. This was like everything to Tolkien. Hmm. Chapter 3, page 233. The wildfire of this American enthusiasm spread to other countries at festives. festivities. A Saigon, in Saigon, a Vietnamese dancer was seen bearing the lidless eye of Sauron on his shield. I found that kind of funny. You see these pagan people in other countries and they're sporting the all-seeing eye. You know, and it's like, oh, well, see, they got that from the Lord of the Rings. No, they didn't. This thing goes back thousands of years. It goes back to ancient Egypt. You know, the all-seeing eye of Horus. It's on the back of your dollar bill. Whatever. Okay, chapter 3, page 233. It says, a psychedelic magazine entitled Gandalf's, Gandalf's Garden was issued with the avowed objective to bring beautiful people together. Its, future, it, or its first issue explained that Gandalf is fast becoming absorbed in the youthful world spirit as the mythological hero of the age. Thank you, Tolkien. 
Um, here again, he says, uh, I think this is in the Life and Letters. Yeah, the Life and Letters. He says, Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the Blessed Sacrament. Not the Bible, not the Lord Jesus Christ, personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh no, it's a cookie that you got to eat. A cookie and some wine. The flesh and the blood of Jesus. It's warped. Page 159 here. Of, let's see, what is this? Is this the... Yeah, this is the life and letters here. Page 159. It says, It appears finally that they were as one might say the near equivalent in the mode of these tales of angels, guardian angels. Talking about the elves again. So again, he does compare elves to angels. And he has elves having relations with men. Down here, number two, orcs, the word, is, as far as I am concerned, actually derived from Old English orc or demon. Which, if you've seen any of the movies or looked at any of the books or whatever, yeah, it's pretty accurate. Um, okay, here we have the, the letters again. Uh, page 189. He says, Reincarnation may be bad theology. That's surely rather... Th than metaphysics as applied to humanity, but I do not see how even in the primary world any theologian or philosopher, unless very much better informed about this re relation of spirit and body than I believe anyone to be, to be, excuse me, could deny the possibility of reincarnation as a mode of existence prescribed for certain kinds of rational incarnate creatures. The Catholic Church doesn't even teach that. What's he doing? Tolkien is a Satanist. He is an occultist into witchcraft. And what he's doing is he's saying he's hiding under the veil of, I'm a Catholic. But in reality, he understands what real Catholicism is. He's in the inner circle of understanding what Catholicism really is. And he's just kind of seeping out some more of this poison. And of course, you know, as you study the Catholic system, more and more they're like, well, you know, maybe the atheists are saved and maybe the sodomites and, the, and maybe, you know, we can all join together and we can all kind of come together and all find God in all the different traditions out there and stuff. So they might not teach it in their catechism, but give them time, they'll be okay with it. Okay, here we are. Uh, let me check and see where this footnote comes from. Okay, this is still life and letters here. It says here, There are thus no temples or churches or fanes in this world among good peoples. They had little or no religion in the sense of worship. For help they may call on a vala as Elbereth, as a Catholic might on a saint. Tolkien's works, these books right here, are Catholic. Down here again, the life and letters. Distinctions between Magia and Goetia. Magia could be uh, was held good per se and Goetia bad. Neither is in this tale good or bad per se, but only by motive or proper or use or purpose or use. Both sides use both, but with different motives. Down here he says, um, anyway, a difference in the use of magic in this story is that it is not to become by by lures or spells, but it is an inherent power not possessed or attainable by men as such. Uh-huh, sure. Um, again, he's showing his occultic roots of this whole thing. Why? Well, what he's doing is he's saying, well, the magic isn't really good. It's not really bad. It's just, you know, it depends on the user and it's not really something that you can learn. It's just kind of a thing that comes upon you and stuff. Straight out of the occult. Are you into white witchcraft or black magic Satanism? Uh, it's all the same, all right? Only the people that are in it are duped. And as you get up higher in the levels, like Bill Schneblin, you know, you watch his stuff, you get up higher in the levels of uh, witchcraft, and all of a sudden you're getting into Satanism. And they're saying, well, there's more power here, but you can still kind of pretend that you're a witch, you know, and everything. Yeah. All right. Continuing here, it says, A good Numenorian died of free will when he felt it time to be time to do so. 
kind of almost sounds like euthanasia. Down here he says, uh, Wizards are not in any sense or degree shady. Not mine. The Astari are translated wizards because of the connection of wizard with wise and so with witting and knowing. They are actually emissaries from the true West. And so immediately from God. Capital G there too, by the way. And these dumb bunnies over here are saying that this is Christian? When the Bible, not one reference in the Bible to wizards being good. Don't tell me that you can line up this with this. You can't. Continuing. When killed by the injury or destruction of their incarnate form, they do not escape from time but remain in the world either discarnate or being reborn. Talking about elves. You know? Interesting. Interesting. Gandalf is a created person, though possibly a spirit that existed before in the physical world. <laughs> and people say this is, you know, oh, these modern Christians. Oh, man, it's like you can really learn about the Bible, you know? Like, totally, man. I mean, you know, the gospel according to Tolkien and finding God in the Lord of the Rings. And I wake up every morning and I, I walk with Frodo. It's just, a, it's Satanism, it's witchcraft, it's just straight out of the occult. It's incredible. Life and Letters here, he says, What I really wanted to make a new version of the Atlantis legend. Hmm. And many believe that the Atlantis legend there was basically a, a city that existed before the flood, when God destroyed the earth. Here... On page 401, he says, I have at last managed to release the demon of invention. So he says earlier, it's that presence that's always there, always present, but never named, you know. Here he says, I, I released the demon of invention, finally. And, you know, of course, people are going to say, well, yes, but you see in Greek philosophy, the word demon is like a, a demoted, you know, I forget the other part of that word, but it basically means like a lower god. It's like a mark of genius or something like this. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, he's supposed to be a Christian. Tolkien was supposed to be a Christian. You know, couldn't he have looked it up in his catechism or in his Catholic Bible and seen that the word demon is a bad thing? No, that spoiled the fun. Continuing here, again, the life and letters. See the page number and everything there. There would be secret societies practicing dark cults and orc cults among adolescents. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, well, you know, uh, you know if, if men get bored and stuff like this, and then, then, you know, there would be secret societies and things like that's just kind of fantasy. Not that it's actually real. Stuff like he was part of. And, you know, there's people that say that he was part of the Order of the Golden Dawn. I haven't found the documentation on that other than Johnny Todd's testimony, which... I think he's pretty reliable, actually, but let's continue here. Um, quotes that deal with C.S. Lewis, okay, from his biography. It says here, during, his, during adolescence, he had professed agnosticism, or rather, he had discovered that for him the greatest delight was to be found not in Christianity, but in pagan mythologies. Okay, that's C.S. Lewis. Down here he says, you... Uh, you mean, ask Lewis, that the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth that works on us in the same way as the others, but a myth that really happened? In that case, he said, I begin to understand. So it's just a myth. But it's a true myth. It's like saying a true lie. What happened with Jesus Christ was not a myth. Okay. Quits, quotes, which are attacks on real Bible-believing Christians. Um... Okay, this is uh, his biography. Mabel would have to face hostility from Walter, her brother-in-law, and from other members of her family, not to mention the Tolkien's, many of whom were Baptists and strongly opposed to Catholicism. All oh, the poor things. Those poor Catholics, you know, Mabel and, and John Ronald Rule Tolkien, you know, they were just persecuted by those evil Baptists and other Christians of the time. Poor little darlings. You know, I mean, just think if they would have converted Tolkien, you know, and he would have actually gotten saved. 
there would not be a Lord of the Rings, and witchcraft and Satanism wouldn't have been introduced to the masses and damned generations of young people to hell. Oh, how terrible. <laughs> Life and letters down here. As for Eden, he says, I think most Christians accept the very simple and uneducated, accept, accept, you know, people like me, the very simple and uneducated or those protected in other ways have been rather bustled and hustled now for some generations by the self-styled scientists and they've sort of tucked Genesis into a lumber room of their mind as not very fashionable furniture, a bit ashamed to have it about the house, don't you know? I'm not ashamed. I believe every word in the King James Bible. I believe when it says Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth in six days, I believe it. Every word of it. Evolution is a fairy tale. I don't believe it for one second. I'm not ashamed to have it around the house either. Okay? Or out in public. Down here he says, I do not now feel either ashamed or dubious on the Eden myth. It has not, of course, historiosity of the same kind as the New Testament. What are you talking about? <laughs> huh? You know, doesn't have the same kind of historiosity? Uh, okay, I can guarantee you that the Hebrew scholars that have preserved the Torah down through the centuries, I can guarantee you that they would disagree with you. Down here talks about Christian myth. So, you know, Christianity's a myth too. Everything's a myth. You just kind of go through life and decide what's a myth and, you know, whatever. Up here he says in a letter, you know, you rather remind me of a Protestant. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Christian mythology, he says, the Protestant search backwards for simplicity and directness is mistaken and indeed vain. You know, and you can read the rest of the thing too there. You know, it's mistaken and, 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 and indeed vain. So, you know, he, of course he calls Protestants anybody who's a, not a Catholic, you know, that's a professing Christian. But the fact is, those of us who say we actually want to go back to the Bible way, we want to actually, there are no church buildings in the Bible, New Testament there. And, you know, a lot of these practices, pulpits and, you know, all this stuff, Sunday best and everything else, you actually start to examine the New Testament and you realize, you know, a lot of these practices are not in here. Well, according to uh, Tolkien here, it's a uh, mistaken and indeed vain to want to go back to the first century practices. People meeting in homes. Mistaken and indeed vain, Tolkien says. Spoken very well by a man that worships in big Catholic pagan temples. All right. Here we have some quotes about Tolkien's drinking and smoking habits. It says here, his autobiography, Speaking of Father Francis, the Catholic priest who raised Ronald and Hillary after their mother's death, he had a private income from his family's sherry business. Hey. <laughs> Catholic priest, Father Francis, keeping that private income coming in, selling alcohol. That's wonderful. Here uh, we have his autobiography again, or biography, I guess. Um, Together the two men helped to form a Viking club among the undergraduates who met to drink large quantities of beer. Talking about when uh, Tolkien was in college. At the university, uh, his auto or his biography, excuse me, chapter five, page one sixty two, the barrel of beer in the coal hole behind the kitchen, which dripped regularly, and said their mother made the house smell like a brewery. Hmm. You see this thing over and over and over again: beer, alcohol. Did you bring the wine? Did you bring the whiskey? Did you? The guy just drank all the time. They met at pubs. But he's a Christian. And his books are Christian. And you can find God in the Lord of the Rings. Well, you know, that depends on which God you're talking about. Here he says, um, in Life and Letters, uh, Spend it entirely in beer and talk. God be with you and guide you in all your ways. <laughs> that's nice. You know, let's just spend our time in nothing but beer and talk. And, and oh, by the way, God be with you. Yeah, sure. Help you stagger home from the pub. CSL had taken a fair deal of port and was a little belligerent. 
C.S. Lewis was drunk? Oh, that can't be. Life and Letters here. In our custom tavern, they came in there and found CSL sitting there. Fill up, he said, and stop looking so glum. Boozing it up. So it was that I received four ports and three sherries from a cheery fellow who laughed, It's all right. You'll find just a nice present from somebody. And of course, you know, I'm not even reading all these different quotations here. I mean, the guy just alcohol, alcohol, alcohol all the time. Incredible. All right, quotes that claim Tolkien's books are historical and not merely fiction. Okay, it says here, this is his biography. Um, he explains it all in great detail, talking about his book not as a work of fiction, but as a chronicle of actual events. He seems to see himself not as an author who has made a slight error that must now be corrected or explained away, but as a historian who must cast light on an obscurity in a historical document. Down here it says, Tolkien had replied, I don't know, I'll try to find out. You know, speaking of his short poem about Arundel. Well, uh, you're the guy that wrote it. What do you mean you don't know? Somebody asked you a question. I don't know, I'll try to find out. What came out of your mind? Yet always I had the sense of recording what was already there somewhere not of inventing. Recording what was already there. Plagiarizing Norse mythology. Middle land. Middle earth. All this different stuff here. I was I kind of had the sense of, of recording what was already there. Yes, because you stole from Norse paganism and witchcraft to make your stories, Tolkien. Okay, he says down here, Life and Letters. I am historically minded. Middle earth is not an imaginary world. The theater of my tale is this earth, the one in which we now live, but the historical period is imaginary. Mine is not an imaginary world, but an imaginary historical moment on Middle-earth, which is our habitation. Okay, well, my Bible talks about from the creation of man up until the time of Jesus Christ there, and then after that. Where was Middle-earth at in all that mess? Wasn't there. Here he says, I am not a model of scholarship, but in the matter of the Third Age, I regard myself as a recorder only. Nice. You're just a recorder. You know, the devil's spirits are the ones that get all the glory, you know, all the credit. 